The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. There's a phrase that you may be familiar with. It's often used when describing battles, at least in our modern age it's used. It's, it's a phrase called the fog of war. It's a phrase that apparently was first coined in German by a Prussian a military official in the 19th century. And then it gained sort of popularity and popular currency in the United States, particularly during the time of the Vietnam conflict and shortly thereafter as people began to describe what had gone on there and some of the mistakes that were made and some of the confusion that reigned. They began to use that phrase again, the fog of war, the fog of war. What the fog of war describes is the fact that in a battle scene, It's very difficult oftentimes to determine what exactly is happening. And it may appear that one particular offensive tactic is working when in fact it's about to be undermined. And and even at a broader scale outside the battle itself, the fog of war implies this confusion even about where the war is headed and what was a success and what was a failure. This phrase became... Uh, so widely used that it was actually used as the title of a documentary which dealt with the Vietnam War. It's actually a documentary about Robert McNamara, who was defense secretary during the Vietnam conflict. And McNamara, in that, in that documentary, it's actually a very uh, excellent film worth checking out, but in that documentary, he has some, some very telling phrases when he describes what was going on in the minds of the political officers who were in charge of that. And at one point, he he describes this great battle and this great difficulty. And he said this, he said, we see what we want to believe. When looking back, he said, it's so confusing that what I realize is we just saw what we wanted to see. And that's that's a good description of the fog of war. And that's perhaps an apt image to have in our mind when we come to this text, because this text is really a description of a great battle. And it's a description of a battle that jumps back and forth uh, between different stages of the battle. And it's a little bit confusing to untangle because it moves from very concrete descriptions of what's happening to images that sort of reflect the feeling of what was happening. And so we move back and forth between feelings and and, and concrete uh, prophecies of what will take place. And furthermore, at a broader level, just as the fog of war deals not just with an individual battle, but really with sometimes a whole campaign, this text also raises some important questions about what what the Israelites, what the first hearers of this, and then what we as hearers of it are really supposed to get out of all of it. Even when you untangle the images and untangle the events and sort of figuring out who's winning and who's losing and what's being described, there's still this overarching question, which is, what does it all mean? And Nahum, I think, in giving us this prophetic description of a battle that was going to take place, actually, in very subtle ways, tells us not just precisely what will happen, uh, but also the significance of the events that will happen. In a sense, what Nahum does is he gives us these descriptions, but he also lifts, I think, in a subtle way, the fog of this war uh, from our minds. Well, the first question we need to answer then in order to see how Nahum does this is we need to answer uh, the question of what exactly is being portrayed. That is, what is Nahum even describing here beginning in verse 3? And I think we could divide up this section really into two. Uh, We could, I think, first talk about verses 3 through 8, which describe what's happening, and then uh, verses 9 through 11, which just extend beyond the battle to the aftermath of the battle, or 9 through 10, rather, extend into the aftermath of the battle, and then, and then verses 11 through 13 really are a second distinct section. Uh, 11 through 13, I think, asks the questions that need to be asked in order to understand what we've just witnessed. So, one through t- or rather 3 through 10 describe the battle and its aftermath, and then 11 through 13 describe for us or ask the questions, the rhetorical questions that are 
essentially the key to unlock the meaning of the battle that he's just described. Well, what is it that he describes beginning in verse 3? Well, he describes, first of all, this army being arrayed in, in defense of a particular city. In, in verse 3, he describes these shields and these armored men who are dressed in scarlet. And the commentators are divided about whether the scarlet in which they're dressed actually is blood, because this is the aftermath of the battle. That's a possibility. Or, or whether, in fact, they, they wore scarlet-colored garments. But in any case, there they are. They're arrayed. They're prepared for battle. And they've been involved, perhaps, in battle, because later in verse 3 it says, "...the chariots are enveloped in flashing steel." when he is prepared to march, and the cypress spears are brandished. So here you have this picture of, the, of this formidable army that has armor and has many men and has chariots and has steel and is utilizing technology uh, for its purposes. And then, then in verse 4, the scene changes because it moves from the, 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 the shot of, of the armies preparing for battle to, to the actual battle itself. And what you see in the battle itself is that uh, there's all kinds of confusion taking place. If you read verse 4, that might in itself be a good descriptor of this fog of war idea because we have these chariots that look as if they're going to be perfectly prepared for battle. But when the battle actually happens in verse 4, they're racing madly in the streets, it says, rushing wildly in the squares. They're dashing to and fro like lightning flashes. So once this battle actually begins, like most battles, it becomes a mass of confusion and chaos. There's great destruction happening, but it's almost hard to see from the perspective of, of the one watching what exactly is happening. It just it just looks bad. It just looks chaotic. It just looks destructive. But it's not entirely clear. And then in verse 5, we have the perspective of a single commander that's described for us. And this particular commander is remembering the nobles, remembering those who are supposed to defend the city. And, and, and what he sees instead is that they're, they're not actually getting into their defensive positions. So He's, as it were, watching from a tower. He sees all this chaos inside the city, and he's looking around for the commanders who are supposed to be really leading the counterattack or leading the defense in this case. And lo and behold, they're not making it up to their, their uh, positions of defense. So he sees, in a sense, all of it going wrong. If you've ever read accounts of battles where outsiders were able to watch the battle take place, you see things like this all the time. You see examples again and again of, of strategies that were supposed to come together in a certain way, but because of the confusion, because of perhaps miscommunication, uh, they don't end up happening a, as they were supposed to. And that's what's being described in verse 5. In verses 6 and 8, there's something peculiar that happens. And I think we can shed some light on this by looking at extra-biblical accounts of what Nahum is describing here. But in verse 6, he describes the gates, the river gates being opened up and the water being diverted. In, in verse 8, he says, Though Nineveh was like a pool of water, now they are fleeing. Stop, stop, he goes on to say. What appears to be descri being described here in a prophetic manner is the way in which Nineveh ultimately was defeated, and one of the facets of Nineveh's defeat, one of the ways in which Nineveh was defeated, was through the diversion of the water sources within Nineveh. So he's describing it in a way that might not be uh, perfectly clear to us, but I think from someone who is familiar with the Battle of Nineveh after Nahum, when they were looking back and reading this prophecy, they would say, yes, it's exactly the way Nahum prophesied it to be. Matter of fact, we have a Babylonian chronicle that describes the events that Nahum is describing here prophetically. It's looking back on them historically, but Nahum's describing them before they happened. And the basic uh, framework of what happened in the fall of Nineveh was this. When, when the, this Neo-Assyrian Ninevite city was at uh, what appeared to be the height of its power, 
the Babylonians uh, came against this city, uh, but they were, they were pushed back. They didn't defeat the city, uh, as a matter of fact. The Assyrians were able to push them away. And, and the Chronicle, even though the Chronicle is written from the Babylonian perspective, describes the fact that the Babylonian army was actually in a very difficult position uh, for some time. But then what happens is this, in the year 615 BC, the Medes, which were at that time this sort of uh, disparate tribal group, comes together and they intervene in the conflict. And it's ultimately the Medes who succeed where the Babylonians fail and they, they end up taking this um, army, or sorry, taking this city just in the way that Nahum described it. So it's the Medo, it's the Medo, it's the Mede, the empire of the Medes, it becomes the Medo Persian Empire, and this Neo Babylonian Empire that ends up defeating the city of Nineveh. And it describes how uh, the, the Assyrian king was carried off just in the way that Nahum describes him uh, to be. Now, uh, as as the, the account continues, it goes beyond the battle into the aftermath of the battle, and it, the description there is much easier to understand. Plunder the silver, plunder the gold. In verse 9, she is emptied. Yes, she is desolate and waste. Hearts are melting, knees knocking. Anguish is in the whole body. Now, we might step back just for a minute before looking at the rhetorical questions Nahum asks, and we might ask ourselves, in what way was this meant to be a comfort to Israel? Remember the word Nahum, the name Nahum means comfort, and he's giving what should be some kind of comforting message to the Israelite people. And, and I think there is comfort here, even in this description of this great battle. The first comfort that I think is obvious from this description is the comfort uh, knowing that the purposes of God will be fulfilled. Remember, Nahum has said from the beginning that although Nineveh appears to be strong, although Nineveh appears to have great strength, in fact, it says, though they are at full strength. Remember, he says that in chapter 1, though they are at full strength and are many, even so, they will be cut off and pass away. So this description of the battle that will overtake the city of Nineveh is a comfort to the people because it's a clear description of the fact that God will actually accomplish His promises. He said He would judge the Ninevites. Uh, when, when Nahum's hearers first heard that sermon, they must have found it almost incredible that He could. But what Nahum does is then he gives even more descriptive evidence of how God will do that. And that was meant to reassure God's people. And then for us, looking back, we can have even greater confidence that God's purposes will be fulfilled. Why? Because we see that Nahum, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, gave specific detail about how this city would be destroyed. And that specific detail was carried out to a T. Even the pagan Babylonian chronicle essentially affirms everything that Nahum writes. Incidentally, this is one of the reasons why critical scholars question the timing of Nahum's prophecy. Like so many Old Testament prophecies, Nahum's level of detail is so precise and so exact that those who doubt the, the reliability and the ability uh, of the Lord to speak prophetically through a prophet like Nahum will say, well, this must have been written after the fact because he's got so many details that are exactly right. Well, it wasn't written after the fact. It was written prophetically. But now that we are after the fact, we can look back and, and have even greater con pro confidence in the promises of God. The Lord tells us many things in His Word. He makes many promises to us in His Word. And those promises might often be difficult for us to envision, for us to imagine, and even for us to trust. But again and again, the record of Scripture is meant to remind us of the reliability of the Word of God, of the promises of God, of the purposes of God. If God's made a promise in His Word, even if it doesn't seem as if He could possibly fulfill it for you because of the peculiar circumstances you find yourself in, even if it doesn't seem that way, know this, the Bible is clear that God will fulfill the promises of His Word. And that's why one of the things we have to do, it's incumbent upon us to do, is to fill our minds with the promises of God. 
We can bank on them. We can be certain that they will happen because God has told us they will. We also can see something here, and I think it's a comfort to us, of the way in which God often works in history. We see this again and again in the Old Testament. Certainly we saw it when we looked at uh, the end of 2 Samuel, but it's something that we find throughout the Bible. And that's this, that God uh, makes uh, a pattern, has a pattern of working through uh, the weak of the world in order to shame the strong. And of course, that's a deliberate echo of what Paul says himself in 1 Corinthians when he describes his own ministry. We were reminded of that even yesterday. But when Paul describes his own ministry and, and the weakness, the apparent weakness of preaching, he said this is how God works, that God works through weakness in order to demonstrate his own strength and power. And that's the kind of thing we see here, that Nahum is prophetically saying, yes, Nineveh appears very strong right now, and it appears as if it could never be toppled. But God works through weak and improbable individuals and improbable circumstances in order to carry out His purposes. His promises will always be fulfilled, and the way in which He fulfills His promises is meant to upend any pride that human beings might take in themselves. I would say also that looked at from the perspective of the original hearers, and especially looked at from our perspective, it is a great comfort to see the power of God on display. The Lord is able to take this great city, this well-defended, technologically sophisticated city, and He's able to upend it in a way that they could not have predicted. In fact, no one at that time, apart from supernatural revelation, ever would have predicted the way in which Nineveh was destroyed. It just didn't seem likely. And there were all kinds of geopolitical events that needed to take place at a tribal level and then at a, a kind of the level of a kingdom in order for this to happen at the time it happened and in the way it happened. But isn't that another demonstration of the power of God? We, we so often think that God can't do certain things, that He is unable to intervene, unable to act in our culture. We look out in despair at the way things are going. It's very frequent. Whenever I talk to people in, in churches, when I'm traveling around, it's very frequent that people will say, you know, it just looks like things are getting worse and worse, and it's we're just on this downhill slope. Well, we may in fact be on a downhill slope. It looks that way to me as well. But the reality is God can intervene. God is a powerful God. He's certainly going to keep His promises. We know that. Uh, but we also have every reason to know that He can uh, overturn situations that appear to us to be insurmountable. That's true at a personal level for you. God's powerful. And it's true at a, at a national level. It's true at a global level. It's true at the level of your churches. The Lord's power is far greater than we ever imagined. Now, let's look at these final verses. Because as I said earlier, I think these final verses, verses 11 through 13, really lift the fog of this battle from us. We got some idea of what's being described. But then the question is, what's the meaning of all of it? What are, what are the takeaways supposed to be? And what the Lord does in verses 11 through 13 is I think He primarily addresses the Ninevites, uh, but in, in, a, in a strange way, as we'll see, particularly in verse 13, I think he, he goes back and forth between addressing the Ninevites and perhaps addressing a broader audience. Look at the rhetorical question in verse 11. The rhetorical question is this, Where is the den of lions and the feeding place of the young lions where the lion, lioness, and lion's cub prowled with nothing to disturb them? Now that's an intentional play on the symbol of Ninevite strength. The, the Ninevites had this symbol of a lion as their, as their symbol of strength, as their, as it were, national uh, symbol. But, and, and so what the Lord, of course, is doing is He's saying, now, wh where is that now? Uh, where are the lions? Where are all these lions I keep hearing about? Seems like they're all removed from the scene. But, but there's, a, there's an intentional, I think, ambiguity there, as we'll see, because while He is addressing the Ninevites, and saying, as it were, I thought you were powerful. I, I thought you were indestructible. I thought you had this hiding place where no one could reach you, this den where you could never be disturbed and never be destroyed. I think he is talking to them, but it is notable that he doesn't name them there. He gives the symbol. It's obvious what the uh, symbolism is. 
but he doesn't name them. And he says in verse 12, the lion tore enough for his cubs, killed enough for his lionesses, and filled his lair with prey, and his dens with torn flesh. In other words, this lion has had its day. There was a time in which it was going out and taking whatever it wanted. But we can't help but remember what it says in verse 10 about Nineveh. She is emptied. Yes, she is desolate and laid waste. This lion that for so long had been able to take whatever it wanted now is completely laid waste, completely empty. And I think the the ambiguity of it, the fact that it goes a little bit beyond Nineveh and is meant to actually pierce our hearts, is showcased in verse 13. Now, verse 13 is a difficult verse to translate. In fact, actually, if you look at the Septuagint and the way the Septuagint understands and translates the Hebrew, the Masoretic text, the Septuagint smooths out some of it in order to make it appear to be slightly more intelligible. I'm not sure that that was the right thing for them to do, though, in this case. Let me read you uh, verse 13 in the New American Standard, which I think translates uh, the Masoretic text faithfully here. Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts. I will burn up her chariots in smoke. A sword will devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the land, and no longer will the voice of your messengers be heard. You hear that strange transition. It talks about you and yours, and then her and hers, and then back to you and yours. And again, this is why the Septuagint tries to smooth all of it out, because it seems as if the writer might be getting things uh, wrong. But, But I think here, actually, there's an intentionality to the way in which the Hebrew text uh, renders it. Because I, I think, as I've said, that verses 11 through 13 are meant not just to speak to the Ninevites, although, of course, it would have spoken to them very clearly. Uh, but it's really meant to speak to all of us as well. Uh, it's one thing to look at the way in which God destroys His avowed enemies, like the Ninevites, and to say, well, there it is, God fulfilling His promises. There it is. God carrying out judgment. There it is, God going into the lion's den, as it were, and emptying it out. Uh, But I think verse 13 reminds us that we're all susceptible to the same kind of thinking that the Ninevites themselves evidenced in their lives. Uh, I think we're all susceptible to think about certain aspects of our lives as utterly secure, utterly free from anyone's hand. I think it might behoove us to ask the question, what are you trusting in? What is it that you think is indestructible in your life? What is it that you think you can do with impunity? And the Lord will never reach in and disturb you in any way. It could be any number of things. You could have confidence in your bank account. You could have confidence in your ability. That will never leave me. I'll always have that. You could have confidence in certain relationships or the way in which God has providentially orchestrated things so that it it appears that you're on the right track. And in your mind, you say, well, well, I'm on the right track. I'll always have that. Uh, Perhaps it's some uh, benefit of background that you have or some way in which you think your abilities will carry you through. Well, you know, all of these things can, as it were, serve the same function as this den of lions in verse 11. And remember what happened there, although they prowled around for a long time with nothing to disturb them, ultimately the Lord carried them out. And that's why I think the Lord is saying here to the first hearers in Israel, and then I think ultimately to us, I'll burn up her chariots in smoke. I'm going to do that. He's already said he's going to do that. He's already shown how that's going to happen. I'll burn up her chariots in, in smoke, but a sword will devour your young lions, and I'll cut, off, I'll cut off your prey from the land, and no longer will the voice of your messengers uh, be heard. There's really, I think, the sharp edge here where the Lord says through Nahum, I'm going to do all this to them, but don't think that you're exempt from this. If you disobey me, don't think that you're exempt uh, from the judgment that befalls those who think they are strong, who think they are greater than me, who think they are beyond my reach. And that's really, I think, what Nahum calls us to consider today. Yes, we should reflect upon the promises of God. What a great comfort it is, really, to know that God will one day destroy His enemies. 
Uh, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. It's not something that we have to concern ourselves with, but we know that God will one day right every wrong. He will bring about justice. He will punish those who persecute His church and persecute His people. That's sure and certain. We can take comfort in it even as we suffer now. Ah, but, but when you think about the judgment of God, also remember that the Lord has commands for you. And the Lord sees the ways in which you are, are considering yourself out of His reach, beyond the reach of His Word. And what the Lord, I think, says to all of us in a chapter like this is that though I will destroy your enemies, you can count on that. I'm also going to come against you in your, in your strength and in your power. These people, these Ninevites, uh, thought that they could make themselves secure. They mocked God. They mocked His people. They had actually turned their backs, as we know, on the Word of God that had been given to them a few generations before. They turned their backs entirely on that, relied on their own strength, and God was going to remove them. But I think God is saying to His people, you know, I'll do the same thing to you as well. Should you ignore me? Should you sin against me? Should you trust in your own strength? And that's the call for us today. Trust in the judgment of God. Remember His promises. Take comfort in those. Uh, but also look at your own li lives and look at the ways in which you are keeping things from the Lord and, and sinning against Him, perhaps in ways that you think will never be found out, that are entirely secret and beyond His reach. And take this as a warning even today. Let's pray together. Our God, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for this teaching from Nahum. We ask that You would Convict us where we need conviction, that you would encourage us where we need encouragement, that in every way you would cause the truths of this passage to sink deeply in our hearts. We thank you for your word. We thank you for revealing yourself to us in and through it. And we pray that you'd be with us in the remainder of this day. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you for tuning in to this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, please visit gpts.edu.